started. Okay, we are now recording. So it is my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth and final uh, webinar in this series. This is our collab. We're the GeoHealth Network and we're happy to collaborate with Canoe. Uh, my name is Ray Jewett and I'm the chair of the GeoHealth Network. We're a student focused health geography working group and we aim to reduce the barriers for students to learn skills and network within this field. And we have other execs that run this organization with me, Naomi, Megan, Emma, Shauna, and I'll put a link in the chat where you can um, learn more about what we do. And we've been so thrilled to partner with Canoe to bring you um, webinars on Canoe data holdings and to highlight excellent students that have used Canoe data um, for fabulous environmental health projects. So we have Eleanor here and Eleanor, would you like to say anything? Hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Eleanor. I'm the managing director for Canoe. So we certainly encourage anybody who's affiliated with an academic institution in Canada to come to the Canoe website, check out the data that we've made just for you. It's easy to use. Um, if you haven't been there, take a look. Um, yeah, we're just as happy to be partnering with you folks at the GeoHealth Network. It's a, uh, an awesome sort of grassroots self-grown network that's really filling a niche, I think, for the student voice. So um, we're happy to be collaborating and hope we'll keep doing that far into the future. Um, I will plug, um, we just had the Canoe AGM and we have a survey open about what kinds of things you think Canoe should be doing. We didn't have that many students at the AGM. So if you are a student, please go to the CANU website. I'll pop the link in the chat and do that survey because uh, um, CANU's role as uh, helping train, um, increase training was kind of low on the priority list. So you might have different feelings. Back to you, Ray. Yeah, thank you. Please um, please fill out that, stu that student survey, or sorry, that survey as a student. It's really important. Um, CANU is, uh, such a powerhouse organization and there's going to be a lot for you and the way to do that is to fill out that survey and have your voice heard and certainly that means more access to data for your awesome projects but it's also could mean uh, more opportunities for training to learn skills like the ones that Adele is going to share with you it could mean more networking opportunities um, perhaps more um, network, networking opportunities that are more relevant to wherever you are. Um, so please go ahead and take a second and fill that out. So we've been able to offer you these seminars thanks to very generous donations um, from Canoe, from the University of Toronto Department of Geography and Planning, and from the University of Toronto School of Cities. So um, for being here today, we have a student lottery where you can win $100 cash. So how it works is I'm gonna put a link in the chat for that as well. You'll be taken to a form and you'll fill out your information and then we're randomly gonna draw uh, a name and then we're gonna send you a check in the mail for $100 and that's as easy as that. So we know your time is valuable and um, we just want to acknowledge that. So without further ado, it is our pleasure to bring to you our speakers for today. Um, Adele Lundy is a, a senior scientific advisor with the New Brunswick Department of Environment and Local Government for over 10 years. Um, Adele's research interests are in epi, biostats, GIS, and population health. She holds a master's of public health from the Faculty of Medicine at Memorial University of Newfoundland. And Adele completed a professional certificate in population health and data analysis from the University of Victoria um, in BC. And this project was completed um, with Adele's supervisor, Dan Krauss, who's on the call. And I believe Adele is going to be making this presentation with some support from Dan. Dan's a health geographer and environmental epidemiologist who specializes in exposure assessment and environmental determinants of health. Uh, with a PhD in health geography from McGill University. And shout out uh, McGill, great department. I believe we have some people on the call who are in that program right now. Um, okay, so I'm going to take myself off here and pass it over to Adele. Yeah. 
Yeah, great. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. So give me a second <laughs> to get that straightened away. All right, uh, so thank you for inviting me to give this talk today to discuss my career journey and the following study on complex relationships between greenness, air pollution, and mortality in a population-based Canadian cohort. And throughout this presentation, I will describe a practical example of how canoe data can be used in high quality research. And also joining me today is Dan Krauss, and he was the pr principal investigator on the study. And I'm gonna talk about how Dan and I met a little bit more when I discuss my background. So I'm gonna discuss a little bit about my background. I started my education with a bachelor in science in biology from the University of New Brunswick. And during this time, during the summers, I worked as um, a summer student for my local public health department. And during that time that led me to want to complete my master of public health. So I then went on to complete my Master of Public Health with a focus on epidemiology and population health from Memorial University. And after I completed that, I went on to complete a population health and data analysis program from the University of Victoria. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about that program. And uh, it's a very excellent program. It's online remote learning, and it provides hands-on learning um, to, that looks at analyzing administrative data and what they do is they use Pop Data BC administrative data, and it gives you um, the ability to actually use their actual data sets that they have housed at Pop Data BC. And um, you get to use um, statistical software packages such as SAS and a um, variety of GIS softwares. So um, I've actually um, <clears throat> recommended this program to many students, and they've done it, and they've been really impressed by the program. I was very impressed by the program. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, during this time, um, I was asked by someone at the University of Victoria to do an interview with um, the organization Women in GIS. And um, I can drop that link into the chat box. And that is an interview I did about um, women in the GIS field. Uh, and lastly, I have future plans to complete my doctorate in epidemiology. And my work experience includes working as an environmental epidemiologist for a private consulting company for many years where I did health impact assessments. Then I went on to become a database analyst with the New Brunswick Institute for Research Data and Training, which is housed at the University of New Brunswick. Uh, we call it the IRDT for short. And the IRDT is a data center that holds uh, health administrative databases. And actually, they also hold canoe data. And so that's really nice that they are able to link uh, the canoe data with the health data in the center. Um, so this is where I met Dan. He was working as an epidemiologist at the time. And I had the great ability to work um, on environmental health studies. And uh, by working with Dan, I was able to advance my statistical and my GIS skills. Um, so I am currently working as a senior scientific advisor with the Department of Environment with the government of New Brunswick. Uh, and here I provide technical and scientific advice on environmental related topics. And I just also want to note that since I started this job, I've referred two individuals looking for environmental health indicators uh, to CNU to use their data. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, supportive of uh, sending people to CNU to use their data. It's a great resource. So now I'm gonna speak about our study objective, which is to investigate the role of residential greenness in modifying associations between long-term exposures to PM2.5 and mortality. So the workflow for our studies is as follows. Uh, we did our study using Statistics Canada data. And so we submitted a research data center application to Statistics Canada to access the study data. 
So RDC centers are all across Canada. Um, they usually house in university campuses and it's a location, a lab where you can access the confidential uh, Statistics Canada data um, for research. Um, so after we were done that, we went through a security clearance and privacy training, um, and we were granted access to complete our data analysis in the NRDC Center. So the results from the data analysis were then vetted for confidentiality and released to the study team. Um, we drafted our research article and it was submitted for publication. So our study data sets included um, Statistics Canada's CanCheck, which is the Canadian Census Health and Environmental Cohort. And the three uh, data sets that we used that Canadian holds were Green Space, Air Pollution, and the Can Merge. And I'm gonna discuss these data sets in a little more detail in my next slides. So the diagram here shows the data linkage to the can check and the can check consists of approximately 3.5 million Canadian adults who responded to the mandatory 2001 Statistics Canada long form census who were then linked to the Canadian mortality database and to the annual income tax filings through 2011. So the linkage to the annual income tax files provided the six digit postal code which allowed us to consider individuals annual residential mobility and the ability to assign environmental exposures. So the core that we use had follow up through 2001 through 2011. And we restricted our cohort to non immigrants uh, to those aged 25 to 89. And that gave us approximately 2.4 million individuals in our cohort. And um, we, uh, a lot of the time we get asked why we restricted uh, to non-immigrants. And the reason is, is that they tend to have notably better health status and health behaviors than the Canadian born population. Now I'm going to discuss our exposure assignments. Uh, first, we assigned satellite-derived annual estimates of PM2.5, gridded at a spatial resolution of approximately one kilometer to, to individuals at their six-digit residential postal codes. And all environmental exposures, including PM2.5, were assigned using a three-year moving average with a one-year lag time. And this info is available uh, at Canoe at a one kilometer resolution all across Canada. The next exposure assignment that we looked at was greenness and greenness was initially at a 30 meter resolution and then we aggregated it to 500 meters. And the estimates of greenness were based on the remotely sensed normalized difference vegetation index, which is the NDVI. And we assigned estimates of exposure to greenness to the representative point of each individual six digit residential postal code. So the index has a range of negative one to one and with negative values representing water, uh, values around zero representing bare soil and the higher positive values representing dense green vegetation. We also use the community level marginalization index, which is for short, it's called the CAN merge. And this is available through Canoe and it has four dimensions, which are the community level material deprivation, residential instability, dependency, and ethnic concentration. And because we had the home postal code, we were able to assign indices of neighborhood contextual characteristics. And we included these variables because the socioeconomic status of people and where they live can influence a person's health. Also, I want to point out that in our study, these indicators were assigned at the census track level to represent a neighborhood because our study was limited to cities. The statistical approach that we used were survival models adjusted for personal and contextual covariates and stratified by sex and five-year age groups. And the outcomes that we were looking at were deaths from non-accidental cardiovascular and cardiometabolic causes. 
So first we ran a fully adjusted model for PM 2.5, followed by models adjusted additionally for residential greenness within 500 meters. The purpose of these second models was to identify to what extent inclusion of greenness in the model impacted the association. Third, we split the cohort into quintiles of greenness within 500 meters and ran those models for PM 2.5 among individuals in each quintile separately. And lastly, then we added to community level deprivation in. So this slide shows the distribution of greenness and PM 2.5 at baseline. So on the left, we can see the full cohort and the mean and the standard deviation. And so we group the cohort into quintiles being in the least to most green. And if you look at quintile one, people in the least green areas have lower than average greenness and higher than average PM 2.5. And people in the most green areas, quintile five, had lower PM 2.5 and higher than average greenness when compared to the full cohort. In this slide, I'm going to show some hazard ratios and their confidence intervals for association between cardiovascular mortality and exposure to PM 2.5. And I wanted to mention that the hazard ratios are per interquartile range. And I am showing the outcome for cardiovascular mortality, but the results were similar for the also for the rest of the income outcomes we looked at. So if we look at the first point on the screen, um, the point estimate, and then the white bar representing the 95% confidence interval. Um, in that first point, in the fully adjusted model, we can see an increased risk of about 1.08 per IQR for PM 2.5. And I just wanted to mention that this is consistent of what we've seen in other air pollution studies. So the second point is the same model and additionally adjusted for greenness. And we see that it's slightly, slightly attenuated effect to about 1.06. Then we split the cohort into greenest quintiles, as you can see on the left side of the graph, uh, going from least green to most green. And we see that all of the effects are occurring among the people in the least green areas. And those in the most green areas, the bottom two hazard ratios, we are seeing no significant association with PM 2.5. So here we group the participants into four scenarios. The two groups on the far left have low greenness and low or high deprivation. And the groups on the right have high greenness or in low or high deprivation. And like we've seen before, um, an increased risk of cardiovascular mortality associated with PM 2.5 among people living in the low greenness areas. Uh, the two lines on the right that are approaching and crossing the line of unity, we see no association with PM 2.5 among people in high greenness areas. So in summary and key messages, we see a pattern of decreasing risks of mortality associated with exposure to PM 2.5 among individuals in each successive quintile of increased greenness. And we also note that living in greener areas may be protective against the effects of PM 2.5. Um, also, uh, studies that don't account for greenness may be overstating the air pollution effect, and people in deprived neighborhoods with high amounts of trees and green spaces benefited by having more attenuated associations between air pollution and mortality than those living in deprived areas with less greenness. So I just want to point out and thank our collaborators and our supporters and co-authors on our paper. Um, they're listed there. And I wanna thank you for allowing me to come present to you today. And that is a, a snapshot of our paper and we can provide a, a link to, to that if anyone's interested in reading it. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Um, that's excellent. Dan, is there anything that you would like to add or follow up with? Um, no, I mean, I think, I think she, I think she covered, uh, covered all the main points there. Um, I'm sure people will have questions for clarification or, or uh, for further details. 
Yes, I see your request for the link to the paper and I'll put that in right now. Um, great, so we have lots of time for questions and discussion. Um, Hands up from Jeremy. Oh, great, Jeremy. Um, so please, Jeremy, would you like to come off um, mute and would you like to ask your question? Hi there, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, it's really interesting hearing about your research and the work that you've been doing. Um, so I was surprised by something in the forest clause and I'm wondering if we can scroll back to it. Sure. The, the most recent forest clause. This Everyone one? just met my mom, by the way, that's who just came out. <laughs> that's my mother, Andrea. <laughs> So I'm looking at the leftmost uh, point, low greenness and low deprivation. Right. Is that supposed to be high deprivation? Well, it is no. not. It is, it is a counterintuitive finding. <laughs> huh. So at, at low greenness, uh, there's high, uh, greater hazard of these cardiovascular outcomes given low deprivation compared to high deprivation? Yes. Why do you yeah. think that is, Dan? Have you guys thought well, of this, that? We, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the, uh, <clears throat> we, I, I don't really have a great interpretation of, of that. I mean, it's, you definitely identified the, uh, yeah, the most counterintuitive or unexpected finding. You know, you would have expected <clears throat> those two on the left there to be, to be reversed. And um, I don't really have a great explanation for. I wonder. Um, I mean, in some respects, Dan. Sorry, I'm just going to hop in and start sure. brainstorming because it is so interesting. Um, it's possible that some of those people are like well-off urban dwellers, where there's not a lot of greenness, but you know they're you know wealthy. I, and I know you put them the deprivation. I mean, that's part of what's going on in deprivation, but there, there could be some other function. Um, I don't know. Did you guys have income and all that in there? What, what else did you control for? We had a lot of uh, individual level socioeconomic characteristics, so income and education and marital status, wow. huh. but we didn't have health behaviors. We don't have smoking uh -huh. or physical activity or obesity, okay. um, which that, that could that could contribute to it. Um, yeah, because if they have lower, you know, healthier habits, then someone with more deprivation, I can imagine that that could result in this kind of differentiation. Well, and there can all, I mean, there's also going to be differences in the, the characteristics of the greenness, not just, I mean, here we're, we're looking at the quantities of greenness, but there could be differences in the kinds of green spaces that are available. And, um, but sure. yeah, this was, uh, yeah, when we've, when we were, preparing this, Adele was like, do we have to put this slide in? Because I know what people are going to ask us about it, and I don't have a great answer. Um, but Yes, you've got to put it in there. Yeah, no, it yeah. makes you think about yeah, what's the next yeah. question. What's the next but, research question? Sorry, Jeremy. But, but beyond, good, beyond, find, good find, Jeremy. <laughs> But beyond yeah. that, that, you know, unexpected, the fact that the, you know, the people in the low greenness and no low deprivation, that that's where we saw the, the greatest effect size. There's that, but you know, the other part that is interesting here is that what you're, what you're seeing on the right there is that in the areas with high greenness, regardless of the, of the deprivation, we aren't really seeing much of an effect with, with, uh, with PM and, and on the other, and then you know, on the two on the left there, uh, obviously it's more elevated on the, on the far left, but in both cases there, in places where there isn't a lot of greenness, where we are seeing elevated associations yeah. with PM. Yeah. So that makes sense, or it's not unexpected, I guess. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. asking, I think, relevant to this conversation if this was an interaction analysis. Or comorbidities. Yeah, did you look at comorbidities? The, these were, what we did is actually split the cohort into different groups. So the, the far left group there is people that were in the bottom two quintiles of green, like in, if they lived in a neighborhood that was in the bottom two quintiles of greenness and the bottom two quintiles of deprivation. Okay. And then ran that on that sub subgroup of people. Yeah. Can I ask then on that, like um, when you split into quintiles like that, I wonder, um, 
if spatially that sort of scatters the clustering of people that live in high and low deprivation neighborhoods. What do you think of that? What do you mean? So like if you take the quintiles of high deprivation and low deprivation and you split people based on that versus if you were to make a map of the clustering you know what I mean? Yeah, we didn't we didn't do that. And that would actually be really interesting. And that could actually help explain this is that yeah. the people that are in the say low greenness, low deprivation could be people that are in totally different cities yeah. from the people in, in the other groups. And so I mean, you know, we've pulled the cohort is pooled among people across Canada. But yeah, these individual groups are not necessarily each necessarily uh, nationally representative, say, because they may be you know, that would be, that would be really, we should go back to the data and Sorry, plot, you know. plot where these groups oh, yeah, were. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll get on that. I do I find, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Great. I just wanted to clarify what my question, but I, I believe I may have cut somebody, so I'll wait until. Okay, well, um, if you want to raise your hand and then I'll put you in the queue. Um, Thank you. But I'm just going to quickly say my little piece and I'll be quiet because no. I know it's not, it's not my, <laughs> We want to, I just want to observe that, you know, whenever you're working on these data, it almost feels like a never ending circle of questions. And I think that it's always hard to know when do I stop? When is this a result I want to publish? How much further can I, I mean, it just feels like there's always so many ways and it's easy to get lost in the details, but I mean, that's what research is, right? We will, you know, put something out and we'll think harder and we'll explore some more. I mean, you could probably spend 10 years publishing just on this data by looking at it different mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think getting it, getting out a small chunk, which actually ends up being an enormous project really is so valuable because then now we're here and we have something to talk about. Right. So Jeremy, did we sufficiently get to your question or would you like to add it was it was more than covered thank you it's really interesting to think about and again thank you for the presentation okay great um stephanie um would you like to come on video and ask your question or sure so um sorry if this is a really silly basic question, um, but I'm like quite new to this process. So I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about your process with the RDC. Um, I'm assuming that you must have um, created your data sets for um, PM 2.5 and greenness before you went into the RDC. And I'm wondering, you must have then linked that either by census tract or postal code and did some sort of join. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and just the process of going into the RDC because um, this is like a big mystery and unknown piece for me <laughs> in terms of trying to prepare my own plan. I'll, I'll let Adele answer that, but I will say don't be, the, the, working in the RDCs gets a really bad rap, but you know, it's, <laughs> It's an, it can be, it's, it's worth it. It's worth, it's worth learning the process and getting access to the data because they have micro data and, and data sets that you can't get anywhere else and that are nationally representative. And it's anyway, I'll, I'll let Adele answer your question. So, um, so yeah, I, or we had a little bit of a different scenario than maybe you would have. Um, we had a co-author that works at StatsCan and I think she's on this call. So I'm going to be very careful <laughs> um, that was able to, um, to help us link that data, the uh, greenness and the air pollution data. Um, but typically with the RDC centers, you can request that. You can request, uh, so if you, you take the data from Canoe, they have the um, greenness data and the air pollution data, and it's by postal code, they have it by postal code, then you can ask StatsCan to then link that data. You have to put in a special request. Dan, am I? Telling the truth here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, Canoe, Canoe will give you a master <laughs> yeah. list of every yeah. postal code in Canada, yeah. or if your study is, say, only Ontario or something like this, you get a master list of every mm -hmm. postal code. This is how they, you get around the, the sort yeah. of risk yeah. of uh, breaching confidentiality, because if you just had, oh, I have these hundred people, I want, I want their data, but no. So Canoe will give you the master list of every postal code, which you can import into the RDC. You do need to mm -hmm. fill out some other paperwork. And then the, the, um, 
can check or the other data sets that are in the RDC will have postal code. So then you have to do this massive merge or join. Yeah. So yeah, Lauren just sent a message. She is the one that <laughs> she can just get, come on and answer that question for you if she wants. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, it's a special request you put in through StatsCan and ask them to uh, to link that data for you. Sorry, can I just ask one more question? Yeah. To follow up? Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was one thing I actually, sorry, you probably said this and I missed it. I wasn't sure if the, you already, I know for sure you got the CanMarch data from Canoe, but mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if you got the other two um, exposure, exposures yeah. from Canoe yeah. or if you, if you made them yourself. At this point, the same ones that we use are available at Canoe. So they're the greenness, the air pollution and the CanMarch. Great. Um, Stephanie, do you have any other questions you'd like to follow up with on that? No, okay. No, that was great. Thanks. Yeah. Feel free to send send me an email if you want more questions about the RDC process or, or whatever, because it's 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 uh, challenging but rewarding. Oh, <laughs> yeah. that's really great. I've been trying to sort of figure out the process on my own by looking you know, through various like DL data liberation initiative documents. And I'm like, oh my goodness, how do people figure this out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's intimidating. And and there's a lot of, that. it's, that's a really, it's a, it's a fact. And what you, there's a lot of people that feel that way and that reach out mm -hmm. to me or, you know, and would reach out to me and say like, I want to do this, but it's too overwhelming. I can't figure out the process. How do you do it? And it's often mm -hmm. easier to just find a colleague or a collaborator, like, can I just do this with you, with you? If you know someone else who's <laughs> who's already got RDC access and knows the system, you know, just get them to, anyway. Maybe we can have like a blog post that we can host on the Geo Health Network resources page, um, and that way, you know, very generous people like Dan. Then you don't have, you know, if you feel like you're sharing the same information often. Um, well, you could have a, you could host us probably, I would think that, I don't know if this would be of interest, but like host a session with like an RDC analyst who, who can explain mm -hmm. the, the process mm -hmm. and, and so on. Yeah. Okay. It is anyway. And if you, no. if you just want to look at New Brunswick data, <laughs> um, <laughs> the canoe data is already in there. So you don't even have to ask for permission. Well, you have to ask for permission to get in to use the data, but it's already there to be linked to all these, the health data, but That's I know. Great idea. The national data. <laughs> One of our co-founders and execs, uh, Emma, is, spends a lot of time in the RDC and uh, um, she works for Laura Rosella and has done a ton of linkages and is an absolute expert. So she's also very busy, but maybe we can prod her and see if she'll host something. But yeah, if anyone on the call, uh, email us, email me if you're interested in hosting anything or hosting any training webinars or writing writing something, writing a blog post, um, sharing your, your knowledge and information. It's definitely helpful. Um, great, thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, Gemma, you are next in line. Awesome, thank you. That was an amazing presentation. Um, I have a quick question about the choice of cardiovascular disease. So what made you choose that? And I wonder if that's maybe part of why you see the relationship between low deprivation and low greenness. So Dan, I'll let you take that one. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't really have a, a specific answer. I mean, those are, I mean, this study was sort of building on previous work that, uh, that I and Adele and Lauren and others have, uh, have done looking at air pollution and then also looking at like we you know we sort of had a larger program of research on on effects of air pollution on mortality and then I had a sort of a new program looking at the greenness and, and wanted to bring those two together and those are sort of the more most common uh causes of mortality that are considered in those i mean they're also the most among the most common causes of mortality so it just sort of made sense to to look at those but i i don't know what, what made you think that that might have been might have led that those that cardiometabolic, for example, or, or cardiovascular might have led to the counterintuitive pattern. 
I, don't, I think just kind of what Eleanor was saying about like the the smoking and some of those individual risk factors that are related to um, like low deprivation and, and in that setting. But I thought it was really cool to link the the greenness and the air pollution because yeah, in a lot of studies it tends to be one or the other and they're so interrelated. So I thought it was very cool. I just didn't know why you picked um, cardiovascular versus like respiratory because I think often people hear air pollution and like jump to that. So. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jenna. Nice to see ya. Um, Gazal. Hi there. I don't know if you can see me, but uh, thank you for that fantastic uh, uh, presentation. I just wanted to kind of add some context to my question. I thought it was so interesting, as Jeremy pointed out, and how the results were appearing. Um, and the reason why I asked about interaction analyses was, was I wondered if, you know, um, another exposure is modifying the interaction between any one of them. So, for example, if you look between uh, the impact of green space on cardiovascular outcomes or air pollution on cardiovascular outcomes. And so if you looked at, at an interaction between those two exposures to see if one is amplifying the effect of the other or not. Um, we've seen this uh, with respect to walkability and prediabetes and ethnicity, where um, when we tried to do an interaction analysis, uh, we were able to see that in some ethnic groups, um, um, ethnicity or and walkability shared an interaction where it was where we could see living in a walkable neighborhood was associated with higher risk of prediabetes. But for other groups, uh, we actually found that relationship to be reverse, where um, some ethnic groups, despite living in a more walkable or sorry, less walkable neighborhood, the risk of prediabetes was higher. So it, sometimes it's hard to answer these questions because there are so many aspects of the environment um, that um, it's, there's so much we can do to try to answer that question and so many methods that we can adopt. But uh, this is interesting to me. And, and I think, um, I, I'm not sure if an interaction would answer the question um, that you're looking for, but certainly um, we've seen this again with high, low density, as well as um, residential density and retail density uh, with respect to walkability and physical activity and health behavior outcomes um, in, a, in a project that was led by Dr. Red Glacier and Dr. Jillian Booth. Um, so just to say that, you know, I feel you, I know this is tough to answer and we're all in this together, uh, trying to decipher the relationships between environmental exposures and their impact on health is very complex. Um, and so whatever methods you use, I'll be looking at because I'm also trying to answer this question. Yeah, thank you. That's that's great. No, thank you. That was uh, that was very informative, and I think that's those are great things that you pointed out for sure. Thank yeah, there's so, so much going on there. It's yeah, yeah. I guess too, you know, just sort of jumping in. I do that is something we talk about in canoe. You know, we we put the data out, and you know, we do what we can, but it's up to the researchers to get in and dig around and play with it, and um, uh, it's just hard to you know, overstate how complex everything is and, you know, thinking that you're just going to get two data sets and a an health outcome and, you know, have this moment. Um, it just doesn't really work that way. It's a lot of exploration. And I know some researchers would say, well, you've got to have a hypothesis and test yes, no, and, and publish it that way. But I do find that, you know, more and more people are just testing, exploring. And I think, Ray, you're comment about visualizing the data through mapping it is so important. Um, one thing that I find is always useful is you run a model and you've got some errors, just mapping out where those errors are can really give you a lot of insight on what's going, what's going on spatially. I think, you know, bringing that in, I know the EPIs don't always go there, right? You know, you've got your bar charts, but yeah, in the GeoHealth network, I'm looking for some maps, right? <laughs> because yeah. Yeah, I think they're really powerful. We were looking at um, trying to predict uh, people's walking to work using Google Street View image stuff, right? And, you know, we throw a couple of, you know, how many people are in a Google Street View image compared to what the census reports walking to work. 
and you just put one variable in and when you look at the errors well they're all clustered in one spot okay so what's going on there right you know <laughs> so that just gives you an idea of okay what other variable can i maybe put in does that tweak me okay i need a suburban urban variable to separate those two blobs out in my model and i just feel yeah i just I like your your thought, Ray, about finding out, well, where are those people? I know that within the RDCs, um, you know, you're probably never going to be able to publish a map, but you should be able at least to do some of that visual inspection in there. Yeah, thanks, Eleanor. I, I totally agree. Um, I love mapping the errors of models. I also love mapping the um, the um, I love mapping the errors and I also love making a map of the measures of model fitness. That's also really valuable. Um, and I think it's, I think there's a common, the quantiles is a common approach in EPI and I think it's useful, but I think understanding clustering um, is important too, because if we go back to our basic you know, principles of geography that things that are close together are going to be more similar. We really need to just come back to that fundamental idea and understand how it how it works for humans. And um, and then there's this tacit knowledge of place. And so you come through your whole epi study, your spatial epi study, and um, when we do these pan Canadian studies and I usually work at like the whole country scale or right now I'm working on a project in South Africa I've never been there. I, I always stop and like you just have to show the maps to someone who lives there. And they'll say, I know what's going on there. And it's just something I could have never guessed. There's just a lived experience that happens in, in these places and spaces that's really important. And that's really where your meaningful interventions and your meaningful policies are going to come from. So it's like these big, these spatial epi studies are fabulous for pointing to these issues like what Adele and, and Dan found. And then translating it, I think, is really more a matter of place and space and and tacit local knowledge is mm -hmm. is, um, you know, irreplaceable. And something that um, when Ghazal was talking that really struck me is this idea that like air pollution really happens to us, mm -hmm. but green space, we almost need to start measuring people using it or not. Because there's sure there's an availability and there's a proximity, but then there's the actual utilization of this green space that we don't know. Um, so you know what I mean? Like air pollution, we kind of, we can measure, we can measure it. What do you think? I was going to say not necessarily. I mean, there mm -hmm. are, there, there's, I mean, depending on the study design and depending on the, the, the sort of health benefit or health outcome we're looking at, it may or may not be more relevant to look at people act like people actively engaging with green space and, you know, or measuring how often do you choose to go spend time in nature or spend time visiting you know wilderness or, or or natural spaces but on the other hand there's a lot of research that really is just measuring like this study for example uh, measuring the what's the amount of green space within 500 meters around someone's home and then looking at do they have better sleep do they have better mental health do they have lower risk of mortality and those are just passive exposures we're we we do not have any idea if those people are actually enjoying those spaces or like spending time gardening or spending time in a park or walking through a wood lot that's near them but we just know hey there's a lot of green space around people and those people tend to be healthier and so that could be you know stress reduction just from having having sight lines of trees it could be noise reduction i mean there's, you know there's a lot of different mechanisms it could be but i i would say that in some ways the greenness also just happens the same way that exposure to the pollution just happens but yeah i think you're right i think but i think there's different things one thing that i've sort of come to learn is that you know we talk about greenness but you know measuring greenness i think there's many ways to do it and you would want to um think about how you're measuring it depending on the health outcome you're looking at if you're looking at obesity and bmi then yeah maybe park access is related sure. to it because it's activity you're looking at allergy or mental health it might just be it's around me um you know there's this idea of complex microbiomes if i live in a place as you know a variety of different types of 
land covers and plants and things, my, you know, maybe my personal, you know, microbiome is more uh, complex and healthier than if I just live in a place that has, you know, six square miles of pavement. You know, there's so many different ways. And I think that's one of the things with the canoe data is I think it's easy to plug and play, but you really have to think about, okay, is this actual measure re like rational for the outcome I'm looking at? And we're always trying to, you know, build more data and more metrics and always looking for people's ideas going, well, hey, this is what I, the outcome I'm looking at. What is the best way to do it? Or could we make a metric that's a little bit more um, aligned with what I think is the mechanism? Yeah. And different, different, you know, age groups, like, you know, kids yes, need a exactly. space to run around in and maybe older seniors don't necessarily need space to run around yeah. in, but maybe space to garden or something like that. Or Yeah. So I would always, you know, caution people. Yeah, the data are there, but you always have to do that thinking, right? You always have to, you know, think about what it, what is the actual mechanism, the characteristic, the, you know, the, the phenomenon that you're trying to, you know, mm -hmm. study and think about it that way. Um, sorry, one last thing to Dan, I guess, is I agree, somebody, uh, this one always bugs me, we, you're right, they always do quintiles and stuff. Um, having written my master's thesis on the modifiable area unit problem. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I always think about the sensitivity to that and and why don't you guys use, you know, some kind of clustering algorithms to break the populations into more meaningful? Oh. Is it just a matter? I know, sorry, you don't have to answer. <laughs> it just it gets so complex and so difficult over time. And I understand, you know, if everyone uses quintiles, then conceptually, we, we understand each study better than if everyone's using different groupings. And I don't know. Well, yeah, and I mean, and, and all, all our ecological, I mean, we've, we used to, we had can march and, you know, that's also at the census tract level, which those are, you know, essentially arbitrary boundaries. Um, yeah, I don't know, I guess, I guess we should have had you on the research team and you could have, you could have done that sensitivity analysis for us. <laughs> this is the next, the next, point. sorry, yeah, You're not, sorry. it's hard because these census boundaries um i'm just like brutally obsessed with the census if anyone has spent any amount of time with me um but um the census boundaries it's so hard because the health indicators that get reported to the census politicians are held to these as performance indicators um but then you know our you know people in communities cross these boundaries to receive care and they cross you know so and then the census boundaries are used for lawmaking, policy making, healthcare funding. So they're arbitrary to human behavior, but they're very relevant to our finances as a country, as a community, to our, our governance. Um, so it's a challenging way forward health geography wise with these boundaries. We, we have to report at them and we want to work with them, but but then we need to understand more about about human behavior across them in health seeking behaviors. So um, it's it's a it's a weird conundrum. Well, I mean, we're talking a lot about the challenges of doing environmental health research and spatial and I don't want to make it sound as though it's just intractable or it is um, fascinating and it is research if we knew the answers then we wouldn't be asking the questions and I just would encourage people to you know keep your curiosity dial all the way up and not feel um, like it's overwhelming or that you're not going to find something I mean it's always always worth doing and always look and you'll always find another question yeah and there's there like yeah I totally agree Eleanor and and then on that note too, like don't, if you're interested in something in this field, like there's space for you to study it and, you know, trust your instincts. If you have a curiosity or a research question, it's valuable to explore. And this is a great space and a great network for you to find other people to connect with, um, to talk about it. So um, there's lots of, lots of space for that. So we have a few more minutes. Does anyone else have any other questions for Adele or Dan? You can pop them in the chat. Um, anything you felt was particularly interesting or useful? 
Um, please uh, put your name in for that lottery. You can win a hundred bucks. Um, okay, well, thank you so much, Adele and Dan. Um, thanks for your hard work, excellent paper. Um, we really appreciate your time and we really enjoyed learning all about your work. Thanks, thanks yeah, for the opportunity thanks. to talk about it. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thanks so much, Eleanor. Thanks, Canoe. Um, this was our final of four <laughs> webinars. So it's been a great winter and now we're into the spring. Um, so we really appreciated this collab with you and it's been excellent working with you. And hopefully we'll, we'll have a chance to do more and bring everyone more awesome health geography. Right, have a good summer everyone, stay healthy, get vaccinated. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I will link the other webinars right now. And this recording will be up soon. So here are the previous ones. Yep. Okay. Thanks, everyone. See ya. See ya. Bye.